Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Expanding Surface Plasmon Resonance Capabilities with Reichert. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Today's webinar is sponsored by Reichert. Reichert Technologies boasts a rich legacy in developing and manufacturing robust, reliable, and high-quality optical instruments spanning over a century. The Life Sciences Division of Reichert Technologies has brought this wealth of knowledge and innovation to its surface plasma and resonance product line. Reichert Technologies Life Sciences addresses the, diver the diverse interests of researchers Researchers in academia and industry with extremely sensitive and flexible SPR platforms. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located at the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. Now, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window. Or you may use the Q&A but button to let us know that you're having a problem. If you can't hear this presentation, as I mentioned, just click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window. We have two speakers for you today. I would now like to introduce them. Philip Page, PhD, Field Application Scientist. Phil has over 10 years of experience working with advanced analytical instrumentation and is published in many peer-reviewed scientific journals. His PhD research focused on investigating sol solute liquid and solute fluid interactions at controlled poor glass surfaces, along with determining protein behavior and dynamics in novel ionic liquid solvents using spectroscopic techniques. Phil is currently the field application scientist for Reichert's Surface Plasma Resonance, SPR, product line. He works closely with customers to develop a working protocol for their SPR-related research. We also have Mary Murphy, PhD, application scientist. Mary is an analytical chemist and a problem solver with many years of experience in perfecting instrumentation used in life sciences research. Her professional background includes analytical research and support in surface plasma resonance technology, chromatography, electrochemistry, microscopy, and spectroscopy. Mary is a skilled analyst with a concentration in both the pharmaceutical and biotech fields. She has considerable ability in method development and troubleshooting. You may now start your presentation. Thank you, Christina, for the very nice uh, intro. And hello and welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending our seminar on surface plasma resonance. So during this webinar, uh, we will discuss the SPR phenomenon, including its theory and applications, and then provide examples of unique applications that can be carried out on records SPR systems. So before we begin, begin talking about SPR, I would like to just take a moment to introduce Reichert and our legacy in the design and manufacture of high quality optical instruments. Reichert's heritage includes developing instruments to determine refractive index spanning well over a century. Reichert has over 20 years of experience in SPR instruments and applications. In addition, our users have published their SPR work in over 250 articles in various peer-reviewed scientific journals. Reichert's SPR systems cover the full spectrum of biomolecular interactions, including protein-protein and protein-nucleic acid, with the sensitivity to also investigate protein-small molecule interactions. Reichert's SPR systems also have the added flexibility to handle crude samples, such as cell lysates, serum, and particulates like whole cells and bacteria.
Likert manufactures two core SPR platforms, a two-channel and a four-channel instrument. Both systems are extremely sensitive and have the performance to investigate very low molecular weight molecules binding to larger protein targets. This high sensitivity also gives increased confidence in the data and allows a user to work at low immobilization levels to optimize data quality. The systems also maximize flexibility in terms of being able to handle a variety of sample compositions, including crude sample types such as cell lysates, serum, and even whole cells. The systems can also accommodate a large number of samples, up to 768 samples, for higher throughput applications. The systems are also scalable to meet your research and budget needs now and later. And in addition to offering these instruments, Riker also has a variety of professional services available to also address your SPR and budget requirements. So now I will transition into briefly describing how the SPR technique works. So to induce the surface plasma resonance phenomenon, a wedge of polarized light is passed through a high index of refraction prism under total internal reflection conditions. In this case, we are using light from LEDs operating at 780 nanometers. In this case, all the illumination light is totally reflected off the prism surface, and the reflected light is very intense across the entire range of angles that is visualized by the detector which is just a photodiode array board. In SPR, a thin film of, a, of an electrically conducting metal is placed directly onto the prism in the form of a metal-coated glass chip. This metal is typically gold because it is the most chemically inert metal that can give an SPR signal in the visible spectrum. The polarized light impinges on the gold chip at an interface between two widely different refractive indices, the gold chip and the medium above the chip, which is typically an aqueous buffer. What happens is an electric field intensity or evanescent wave is created as the light impinges on the gold chip surface. This wave penetrates into the gold surface and is absorbed by the free energy electron density clouds of the gold metal. This interaction generates oscillating electron density waves that are bound to the gold surface called plasmons. So what happens is when the momentum of the incoming light matches that of these plasmons, we get resonance or energy transfer. And this resonance effect causes a reduction in the reflected light intensity with an energy minimum occurring at a specific resonance angle. This angle is sensitive to changes in refractive index occurring above the gold chip surface. And that's how the technique gets the name surface plasma resonance or SPR. Now, if we envision tethering a biological molecule such as an antibody to the gold chip surface, and then introducing its binding partner, the antigen. The antigen will bind to the mobilized antibody and in turn cause a change in refractive index. This change in refractive index causes the resonance angle minimum to shift to a different angle that is proportional to the mass of the bound material on the gold chip surface. In the SPR instrument, this angle change is converted to a response and recorded as a function of time known as a sensorgram. SPR instruments measure very precise changes in refractive index or mass at the surface of the sensor chip. The traditional unit of measure is micro refractive index units or one times 10 to the minus six refractive index units. This corresponds to a change in mass at the chip surface of one picogram per millimeter squared. So in essence, what we have is a very precise refractometer that also is a very precise mass sensor. 
the RMS noise level of Rikert systems is about 0 0.05 micro RIU, or a mass change equivalent to 50 femtograms. This high sensitivity enables the Rikert systems to monitor either low molecular weight molecules or very few molecules of higher molecular weights with increased confidence. SPR can tell us many things about how two molecules bind or interact. Simple tests can quickly determine whether or not there is binding and rank the relative binding level of many compounds. More complex experiments are able to characterize rate constants, or kinetics, the on, the on and off rates of the interaction. In addition, data from experiments where responses reach a steady state is used to calculate the binding affinity or equilibrium binding constant. SPR can also be used to determine concentration and thermodynamic constants to understand the mechanism that's driving the interaction. So in summary, SPR is a very information-rich technique that quantifies the kinetics and affinity of the interaction, providing a comprehensive characterization. Molecular systems can quantify interactions within and between the major classes of biomolecules which include proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and lipids. With also having high sensitivity, record systems can also probe interactions of very low molecular weight compounds binding to larger protein targets. Furthermore, record systems can also be used to study interactions with whole cells, bacteria, and viruses because of record's robust fluidic design. In summary, small molecules less than 100 Daltons binding to larger targets, such as proteins, and proteins binding to particulates, like whole cells, can all be studied with the SPR systems. Um, now we show an uh, example of our low volume flow cell. The image to the right shows the placement of the sensor chip on the instrument prism. Sensor chips are available with a wide variety of surface coatings, including the industry standard carboxymethyl dextran and planar chips with carboxyl groups and a polyethylene glycol background. The flow cell with a separate path for each channel is then positioned and locked over the sensor chips. We have flow cells for both two-channel and four-channel SPR instruments. The flow cell is readily accessible and is easily taken apart and cleaned in the event of a plug. The small volume and low dead volume flow cell, in combination with high flow rates, lends itself to the measurement of fast kinetics. Our two most popular sensor chips are the planar carboxyl PEG chip and a chip with a three-dimensional carboxymethyl dextran surface. The planar chip was developed by George Whiteside's, Whiteside's group at Harvard University. It is a low capacity chip, which helps generate good kinetic data. The chip works well for 1,000 to 1,200 Dalton peptide analytes and large to very large biomolecules. It has very low nonspecific binding characteristics due to the polyethylene glycol surface coating. To the right here, the carboxymethyl dextran chip has been used in the majority of published SPR studies. It is a flexible, protective hydrophilic matrix with large immobilization capacity and works well for small molecule analysis, peptides, and proteins. The surface also tends to resist nonspecific binding. Next, we also have available a number of pre-derivatized chips. For instance, streptavidin or neutroavidin is used to capture biotinylated molecules and is a stable capture. A nickel NTA chip is used to capture histag proteins and tends to result in a decaying surface. Regeneration is with typically either EDTA or imidazole. A planar hydrophobic surface is used to capture lipids. Regeneration there is with CHAPS. A protein A surface is used to capture IgGs. Regeneration is with pH2 glycine. 
Now we will transition into some examples of data acquired on Rikert instruments. Example one will show results from traditional experiments, an antibody antigen experiment and an enzyme binding to several small molecule inhibitors. Examples two and three will cover more unique applications involving cell studies. Example four is the use of a Rikert SPR in combination with mass spectrometry. Example five is a liposome peptide binding experiment. Uh, so in the, first, in the first instance, uh, we'll look at a traditional biomolecular interaction analysis. Here, anti-HSA is coupled to a planar sensor chip using amine coupling. After EDC-NHS activation on both sample and reference channels, the antibody is flowed over the sample channel only. Blocking is then carried out using one molar ethanolamine pH 8.5 over both the sample and reference channels. On the right of this slide, a strip chart of six concentrations of HSA were injected with regeneration using 10 millimolar glycine pH 2 with 10% glycerol added. The last injection is a blank. The final graph shows the normalized, aligned, and reference subtracted time dependent response curves for the six different HSA concentrations, which range from 40 down to 1.25 nanomolar. The red line is the fit to a simple bimolecular model. As seen from the data, this assay fits very well to a one-to-one -one model with a KD of about 6.6 .6 nanomolar. Uh, next, we look at um, inhibitor binding. Um, two small molecules, 4-CBS and methane sulfonamide, are binding to carboxy benzene sulfonamide. Um, sorry. Um, carbonic anhydrase. First, we look at the binding of 4-carboxybenzene sulfonamide, a 200 Dalton analyte, to a mobilized enzyme. In this instance, carbonic anhydrase was amine coupled to a carboxymethyldextran chip via the same procedure outlined for anti-HSA. The normalized sample overlays are in black, and the model fit is in red. Each analyte concentration is injected twice, with the concentrations ranging from 20 down to 0.08 micromolar. Buffer blanks were also injected and the data was refer double referenced. That is, both the reference channel and the reference buffer blanks were subtracted out. Global kinetic analysis of this enzyme inhibitor pair yielded a KD of 809 nanomolar. Since the data shown reached equilibrium, the equilibrium dissociation constant was also obtained from a Langmuir binding isotherm. For each injection, we plot the average response value at equilibrium of about 10 data points versus concentration. The KD from the FET is 857 nanomolar, which agrees well with the kinetic result. The second example is the binding of the same enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, to an even smaller inhibitor, methane sulfonamide, which is a 90 Dalton analyte. This is a lower affinity interaction with a KD from the kinetic fit of 652 micromolar and a KD from the equilibrium fit of 650 micromolar. So seen from the previous slides, Rikert's SPR systems excel at investigating biomolecular interactions, but the systems can also be used to study whole cells. In this example, Rikert's SPR systems are used to investigate cell adhesion kinetics. This application involves probing endothelial cells and their interactions with common surfaces that mimic human tissue. Specifically, this example is going to involve SPR to probe the nature of endothelial cell interactions with stromal type matrix cell proteins, collagen 1, and basement membrane type protein matrigel. So the figure shows the vessel formation process. In vivo, endothelial cells secrete basement membrane proteins such as collagen 4, 
which creates a barrier between the endothelial, endothelial cell and stromal tissue that are composed mainly of structural proteins like collagen 1 or collagen 3. When the basement membrane becomes damaged or thin due to injury, endothelial cells come in contact with stromal tissue and blood vessel growth is initiated as cells proliferate and local nascent blood vessels form. So this graph shows the interaction of the different matrices being immobilized onto the gold chip surface as well as their interactions with the endothelial cells. So in the first 1,000 seconds of the graph, and basically the inset in the upper left corner shows a blow up of the first 1,000 seconds of, this, uh, of these curves. This is where the three different matrices, collagen 1, matrigel, and serum, were mobilized onto the gold shed surface. As we can see that from the plot, that matrigel is immobilized much faster and to a much larger extent as compared to the other two proteins. This is mainly because of the favorable um, electrostatic interactions between matrigel and the um, carboxylated sensor chip surface. After those matrices were immobilized, cells were profused over the surface, beginning at about 1,000 seconds. As we can see, upon the profusion of the cells, we see immediate response from the collagen 1 surface. We can see we get a rapid increase in response. The response for matrigel and serum are much less as compared to collagen. So basically what this shows is that differential cell adhesion to immobilized proteins can be correlated to the protein surface energy. In addition, proteins with higher surface energy have greater tendency to bind cells, like collagen 1 in this case. This slide shows the actual optical images, the optical images obtained off the gold chip surface after the profusion of the cells on the three different matrices. As we can see by the images, we basically have a very uniform and basically a, a monolayer of cells on collagen 1 and matrigel with more spotty coverage on the serum surface. So next, the research was taken a step further and we, we wanted to investigate how SGR can actually be used to sense hyperosmolar shock. In this case, the cells were challenged with a 100 millimolar mannitol solution, which is going to be hypertonic as compared to the isotonic um, piece buffer. So as we can see upon the initial injection of the mannitol solution, we see a very rapid decrease in response for collagen 1. This decrease, to some extent, is observed in matrix gel, and basically is non-observant with the serum surface. So this basically shows that, uh, and then after the surfaces were subjected to the mannitol solution, we can see for collagen 1 that the baseline starts to return back to the same level, but never quite gets back to the original starting point, meaning that we did either um, have a uh, irreversible effect on the cells, or we might have sheared some of the cells off with the hypertonic solution. So now we look at the optical images after challenging the surfaces with the uh, hypertonic mannitol solution. As we can see here, the coverage is definitely less on uh, most of the surfaces, although collagen 1 still has a fairly dense um, cell coverage. But we can see here that basically the mannitol solution actually sheared off some of the cells on the matrix gel and basically most all of them on the serum surface. So conclusions, we can actually uh, correlate the increased binding efficiency with collagen 1 with basically the um, increased amount of Lewis acid and Lewis base groups that are accessible to interact with the endothelial cells. 
Um, and this is basically the condition when the endothelial, endothelial cells um, actually interact with the stromal tissue as they, undergo, as they undergo blood cell or blood vessel growth. The matrix gel surface has a much lower acid, Lewis acid and base uh, groups. And that correlates with the reduced interaction with the endothelial cells. And this typically occurs when the cells form monolayers on basement membranes. So then we were able to calculate the Young's modulus to really determine the strength of the adhesion. In this case, collagen has about fourfold higher binding or adhesion strength as compared to matrigel. And these results correlate very well with previous measurements carried out with atomic force microscopy or AFM. We can also conclude that SPR is a very useful technique to probe cell matrix interactions, um, including both specific and nonspecific adhesion systems. These two types of interactions are typically, uh, or typically coexist in particular biological contexts. SPR is useful to dissect intermolecular force characteristics of cell adhesion in different model systems, especially at short length and time scales typically observed with SPR. In addition, hyperosmolar shock studies can be carried out with SPR and really quantify the strength of cell interactions with proteins. Using SPR is a much, uh, inex much more inexpensive, simpler, and easier technique compared to other past methods. And in addition, we obtain similar qual quantitative results in comparison to AFM. Next, we'll look at protein binding to live CHO cells. Recombinant therapeutic proteins introduced over 20 years ago generate billions in revenue from a variety of products. For these biopharmaceuticals, CHO-derived cell lines are the preferred host systems because of their advantage in producing complex therapeutics and manufacturing adaptability. For our SCR experiments, CHO cells were captured over polyl lysine. As a first step, polyl lysine was amine coupled to a planar chip. CHO K1 cells were then captured over the left channel only of a two-channel instrument. The baseline increased by about 644 micro-refractive index units. Next, we looked at binding to fibrinogen. A series of five concentrations of fibrinogen were injected, ranging from 184 nanomolar up to 2.94 micromolar. Binding was carried out without regeneration between each analyte injection. Data was fit to a mass transport limited one-to-one -one binding model in clamps. The KD value obtained was 62.4 nanomolar. The conclusions from our cell binding studies are as follows. Results indicate that the measurement of cell adhesion can be very easily performed using a Reichert SPR system. In general, studies demonstrate the ability to perfuse live cells and probe cell protein interactions in a time scale of typical SPR experiments. Reichert SPR systems provide the means to obtain quantitative measurements by enabling ready manipulation of cell capture flow rates, detachment kinetics under defined shear stress, and studies of osmotic pressure perturbation. In comparison to other computing techniques, like atomic force microscopy, SPR measurements are more straightforward and cost effective. And the measurements reflect the behavior of the average cell in the cell population, rather than just individual cells. In the next example, example four, we show how SPR can be used in combination with mass spectrometry. This pairing allows the user to study kinetics and also to determine the identity of what is binding in a mixture. The SPR is our automated two-channel model, which can be coupled to any mass spectrometer via the newly developed interface. 
Work on the interface has been carried out by Professor Michael Przelski's group at the Steinbeis Center for Biomolecular Analysis and Biomedical Mass Spectrometry in Germany. The coupling schematic is shown here. Schematic workflow of epitope and interaction analysis using the online SBR MS epitope analyzer is shown. After sample injection, item one, the analyte is captured on the affinity chip, item two, followed by the SBR chip, item, item three, for kinetic analysis of the affinity interaction. After sample processing through the desalting interface, items four and five, structural analysis is performed by ESI, electron spray, ionization, mass spec. Total experiment time is about 70 minutes. In our first model system, we look at heart-heart myoglobin, or HHW, binding to anti-HHM. The online MS, SBR MS system is capable of detecting and identifying the affinity interaction of the myoglobin, antibioglobin, and a body pair in real time, and the recorded spectra show recognition of the ABO myoglobin. SDR kinetic evaluation of hollow myoglobin is shown from online processing, which yielded a KD of about 450 nanomolar. The total ion chromatogram shown here shows a sharp elution signal at around 5.3 minutes. The multiply charged protonated molecular ions identify the unfolded APO protein recognized by the antibody. The mass spec used here is a Brecker Esquire 3000 plus ESI mass spec. In our second model system, we look at epitope identification and affinity determination of A-beta specific antibodies by online, by our, again, our online SBRMS technique. To identify the epitope, the A-beta autoantibody was immobilized on a dextran SBR affinity chip, and a triptych mixture of A-beta peptide fragments was injected. Subsequent online desalting of analyte prior to mass spec was performed after elution of affinity captured A beta peptide, which provided identification of the A beta 17 through 28 epitope peptide with a protonated molecular mass of 1,324.8. Following elution of undigested A beta 1 through 40, through the microfluidic interface, SBR affinity determination revealed a high affinity with a KD of about 3.5 nanomolar. In summary, with a combination of SBR and mass spec, we are able to do affinity-based biomarker evaluations identify protein and peptide epitopes. We can also do precise antibody affinity characterization, and we can do a direct label-free antigen quantification. The final application that we will discuss is a peptide interaction with liposomes. This work was actually carried out by a group at uh, Kyung Puck University in South Korea, and the reference for the work is shown at the bottom of the screen. Specifically, this application compares a newly identified peptide-based phosphatidyl serine indicator, PSP1, with an exon 5, which is a common probe for molecular imaging of apoptotic cells. So the first step in this work was capturing the liposomes. The vesicles were actually extruded through a 100 nanometer filter or membrane prior to flowing over the center chip surface. In this work, a hydrophobic surface was used, which is basically phytosphingosine covalently attached to a carboxymethyl dextran surface. The hydrophobic tails of the phytosphingosine extend out of the dextran matrix and are accessible for attachment to the liposomes. 
by capturing the liposomes in this way, the bilayer conformation of the vesicle is preserved, as opposed to the vesicle squashing into a monolayer. So we actually are studying the interaction with the intact liposome with the bilayer conformation. After the liposomes were captured onto the center chip surface, the proteins were then injected at various concentrations over the fossil tidal serine uh, liposomes. So we can see here the kinetic results obtained for PSP1 and Nexon5. The first uh, observation that we can see is the concentrations for PSP1 are about 100-fold higher as compared to a Nexon5. In addition, the association rate or on rate is also faster for a Nexon5 and PSP1, and the overall KD or affinity constant is about 1,000-fold higher for a Nexon5. However, we see main a, a pretty big difference in the dissociation rates. We can see that for PSP1, the, dis the, the uh, dissociation rate constant is about tenfold uh, slower as compared to a Nexon 5. And as it turns out, in other studies presented in this work, especially cell studies, it's shown that actually PSP1 is actually uh, a better inhibitor to the PS vesicles. And with the SPR work, it's really that the off rate here is a major player. And SPR basically confirmed that uh, by looking at the actual bonding kinetics as opposed to just looking at the overall bonding affinity. So with that, uh, we would like to conclude this webinar. Um, we thank you for attending and for uh, um, we encourage you to also um, ask questions. But prior to that, I just wanted to end with the summary slide and kind of talk a little bit about Riker, what Riker has to offer. So Riker wants to be your partner every step of the way. Um, Riker has top-notch customer service and support solutions. Our systems also maximize uptime that drives better results. Riker's SPR systems can solve your research bottlenecks. As we mentioned before, they're scalable to meet your needs as well as your budget, and they're also accessible to your individual lab. The systems produce reliable and very high quality binding data with kinetics, concentration, and thermodynamics. We can also help answer your questions quantitatively. The record systems also increase your sample flexibility in terms of being able to handle different sample compositions, like whole cells, cell lysates, and even serum. So you can do a lot more with the system than just the routine interaction analysis. The systems also reduce your equipment and maintenance costs with the robust fluidics design of the systems. So thank you again for your attention, and we look forward to addressing your questions. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Murphy and Dr. Page. We want to get right to your questions and input, so here's a quick reminder how to let us know what you have to say. Questions, etc., can be submitted via the Q&A button at the lower left. We will try to get to all of you, but if not, we'll be sure to follow up with you after the broadcast. Our first question is, how do you compare SPR to using other label-free techniques, such as ELISA? Sure. So um, basically, comparing SPR to other techniques, such as ELISA, um, you know, as, as you probably saw during the presentation, SPR basically follow the bonding in real time. So SPR gives you the actual time-dependent bonding curve, um, which basically reveals the bonding kinetics of the interaction. Um, a technique like ELISA basically is an endpoint analysis that basically can kind of clue you into the bonding affinity, but does not tell you anything about the bonding kinetics. Um, so SPR is a much more information-rich technique. Um, and again, can not only reveal the bonding affinity, but also the actual bonding kinetics. Now what determines the implementation of either a planner chip or a dextran? How do the analytes differ? 
Yeah, so usually you choose the chip based on the type of interaction you're looking at. So if you're looking at a protein-protein interaction, you might tend to use the planar chip. If you're using it a protein small molecule type experiment, you would need dextran. In terms of um, in terms of analytes, so the main difference would just be that if you need to look at a small molecule interaction, you would need dextran for sure. Do you want to add anything else, Paul? How can you create different channels for different analytes? Can they be visualized by modifying the surface? So um, in this case, what we're doing is the, the, the different channels are actually created by the flow cell. So the flow cell is actually what determines the, the fluidic uh, channels. So we actually have, you know, in the two channel, we have uh, two separate channels. And in the four channel instrument, we actually have four separate channels. Um, so typically, um, one of those channels, though, has to serve as a reference or control. Um, so with the two channel instrument, we basically have one usable channel. And with the four channel, we basically have three usable channels. So you can actually immobilize um, on the four channel different uh, molecules, like different proteins or whatever you're studying, on those three different channels. And then you can then uh, come in with the analyte and flow that analyte over all those channels in, in series. So in essence, you don't have like, uh, you basically could have one channel per a ligand that's mobilized to the surface, and then the analyte uh, can be injected either over one channel or over all channels uh, in series. Were the cell images taken by a microscope coupled to SPR? In this case, the, the uh, microscope was not directly coupled, but it was run, you know, at, at the same time, basically, is when this was done. Do you manufacture SPR chips for other SPR instruments? Uh, so currently, we have um, we manufacture a uh, actually kind of two two channel systems. Uh, basically, one is a manual or semi-automatic system, and the other one is an automated two channel system. Um, and then we also have the uh, four channel system, you know, uh, for looking at um, you know higher throughput. In terms of chips, um, we do manufacture the the sensor chips, the actual surfaces that go on top of the gold chip. Um, we actually do and offer those through Reichert. Um, so we, those chips that Mary presented on, um, you know, we do actually uh, manufacture those uh, at Reichert. Can SPR be used to study DNA and RNA interaction? Certainly, yes. Yeah, SPR is a, is a very good technique uh, to, to do that work. Uh, typically, what you do is you work with biotinylated uh, DNA or RNA, and you can actually capture that very easily on a Shepdavidin surface. Um, and of course, the DNA is very stable, so um, regeneration and uh, conditions are usually not um, as critical, you know, as with proteins. Um, so that's a very um, uh, kind of simplifies the experiment somewhat. So yeah, it's very very doable and and uh, very uh, uh, you know, relatively easier experiment. Could you explain how SPR calculate Young's modulus? I think we'll have to take that one offline. Um, I, uh, we prefer handling that via either direct contact or via email. Okay, great. Uh, next question, was the microscopic view in real time or separately on the side from a different analysis? It was, it was separately on the side, but we do have a photo cell that could be used with this. This particular research was not done with our photo cell. Okay, let's see. We have more questions coming in. Let's see. Um, 
Um, can you approach work for analyzing complex samples? Sure. Yeah, actually, that's one of uh, you know that's actually a, a very um, uh, you know big advantage that that record offers is the the systems uh, institute a very uh, uh, robust fluidics platform, and that fluidics, fluidics platform can accommodate uh, you know crude or complex samples. So you can actually run you know lysates or serum, you know, and other kind of crude samples across the uh, gold chip without you know having the risk of clogging anything expensive. Um, so it's very doable, um, and also. Um, we can also, you know, as we presented, maybe couple SPR to our techniques like, like mass spec and actually identify what is actually binding out of a complex mixture. So you can actually get binding information as well as identification in one experiment. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Philip Page and Dr. Mary Murphy for your presentation. Do you have any final comments for our audience? We just want to thank everybody for coming to our presentation and hope that you have a few minutes to fill out our poll that we sent out. Thank you again. Now, if we weren't able to speak with you directly today, we'll be sure to follow up with you. We want to thank our presenters today, and we want to thank all of you for joining us here at LabRoots.com. We'd also like to thank Reichert for sponsoring this live event. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website through August 14, 2017. We will let you know when it's been posted, and we hope that you pass this information on to any colleagues who couldn't, take in, to, who couldn't partake in today's broadcast. We hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.